Hi, Brother Roy here, Old School Bible Baptist. Uh, today we're going down in the trenches and we're going to school. Got to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. So what we're going to look at today is where did our Bible come from? Where did our Bible come from? Where did all of those books that people call Bibles, where did they come from? So it's going to be, this is going to be a history of the Bible today. So strap on. <laughs> we're, we're going on in. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your perfect word. Thank you for having your secretaries write it down. Thank you for preserving it without error that we may have in our hand today the very living words of the living God without error in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. So uh, we're not going to deal with the Old Testament today. Uh, today, what we're going to do, we're going to deal with the New Testament. Um, your King James Bible Old Testament is from the Hebrew Masoretic texts. Okay. Uh, and We'll talk about where the other ones get their Old Testament from, but your King James Bible translated the Hebrew Bible that the Hebrew people used from the Hebrew into the English, and that's what you have in your King James Bible. You don't have that in any other Bible. What you have in any other Bible is a translation of some Greeks translated some Hebrew, and so you got like you got two two translations down the pipe there. So you have a you have an English translation of a Greek translation of the Hebrew. King James Bible comes straight from the Jewish Bible. Amen. So let's wrap that up right there. But then we move on to the New Testament. All right. Now uh, what we're going to want to focus in on, if you'll remember, back in the book of Acts. There was a place that was the headquarters of the New Testament Body of Christ Church, where they were first called Christians, and that was in Antioch. So we're going to be focusing, number one, on Antioch, all right? And that's where the apostles were taking their missionary journeys, and the New Testament church spread from Antioch. The books of the New Testament in the originals were gathered in Antioch. And that were your originals of your 27 books of your New Testament were written between 30 What did I say? 30? <laughs> it's not 30. Duh. Between 33 A.D. And 90 A.D. Amen. So this is what was going on. That's why when we talk about what come, comes out of, out of uh, Antioch, that was in the area that was called the Byzantine Empire. And uh, that was in Syria. All right. So when we talk about this family of manuscripts that came out of Antioch, we talk about the Syrian Byzantine text type, which came from the headquarters of the believers where the church was spreading out from. Amen. So that's important. What's, what's important to realize is there are only two Bibles. They label a bunch, slap a bunch of label, uh, labels on your Bibles. Uh, say it's this translation, that translation, this translation. But I'm going to show you that there's only two Bibles, all right? There's the one that came out of Antioch from the apostles and was given to the church, all right? And the other line comes out of Alexandria in Egypt, okay? There was a school in Egypt, the School of Alexandria. You know, Alexander the Great conquered Egypt, and uh, this this city was named after him out of Alex, after Alexander the Great it was the, the the Ptolemy dynasty that took over the land of Egypt 
And when they did, they started a, a great school, a great university, the University of Alexandria in Alexandria, Egypt. And it was started by a guy named Philo, and he was a Greek philosopher. So this was a school of secular Greek pagan philosophy. And as, in, as any school, they are interested in, in all areas of learning and knowledge and literature and what have you. So they end up down there in Egypt in this, in this school, largely Gnostic pagan philosophy school. They end up with some guys down there who are interested in the Old Testament. They're interested in the, in the New Testament and they get a hold of some, the manuscripts down there. And that would, ha that would happen uh, around 200 AD in the school of Alexandria, Egypt. They, they get a hold of the manuscripts, and that's the manuscripts that, you know, that came out of here. So, so the, these originals from Antioch, from the church, ends up in this pagan school down there in Egypt around 200 AD. Okay, so then as this is, as this is going along, um, over here in the true line, from Antioch, and the originals get about 90 AD, and you, you get your first Bibles right then. You get a, a, a Syrian Peshitta Bible uh, between 100 and 200 and AD. That, that, that's completed. Uh, you also get an old Latin version between 100 and 200 AD that's all based on this line, what we call the majority text, and, and what we later call the Texas Receptus, or the received text. But you'll see through here, we get a Syrian Peshitta Bible, we get an old Latin Bible, and, uh, and that's when, the, when our papyri manuscripts begin to be gathered. And papyri just simply means a, a paper. And uh, these are, uh, this, they were from a papyrus plant, and they made paper out of this papyrus plant. And it was a very fragile substance. It didn't last very long. So the copies of, of the Bible would be by those who believed the Bible and believed every word and recognized this was divine revelation from the Holy Spirit of God. They carefully, carefully, uh, by divine providence, they would, they would transpose from papyrus to papyrus to papyrus. You know, when one piece of paper was wearing out, they'd copy it down. They'd copy it down. They'd copy it down. And that's how the, 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 the words, the very words, each and every word, were preserved down through the papyrus manuscripts. And we have some of these papyrus manuscripts dating from 150 to 400 AD. Now, then... Then we begin to get into unical and cursive manuscripts as the, the, the materials used to preserve becomes ba better and uh, um, they, they begin to uh, write in cursive and they be, begin to use uh, 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 what we call capital letters. And, uh, and we, have, we have these manuscripts here uh, between from dating between 150 and 1500 A.D. And when you add up all the papyri and the cursive manuscripts uh, on the true line, we come to over 5,000, 5,000 manuscripts that are all in agreement with what, what God gave the apostles in the church in the true line. Amen. So over on the other side, what we got going on over here is here in this school in Alexandria, they get they get the, the, the Papyr manuscripts too. And what happens is there's some guys over here who were Gnostics. Uh, they were not believers. They were when you when you read the the stuff they believed, they were rank heretics. I doubt if they were even Christians, but there's a guy named Clement from 150 to 215. And then there's a guy named Origen from 184 to 254. And what these guys do is they get a hold of these manuscripts and they, they don't have the respect for them that the believers have. They look at those manuscripts just the way they would look at any other earthly writing of man. So they feel totally 
Totally, and these these are the scholars of their day. Amen. These are the these are the great minds, and 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 what they do is they go in and they begin to look at these manuscripts and well, this doesn't make much sense. Well, we change this one over here to to say that, and this would be much more beautiful language, and and I'm smarter than this, so let me change. So that that's where it got corrupted here in Alexandria in Egypt, and you remember. God has always used Egypt as a type of the world. He brought his people out of Egypt. He called, called his son out of Egypt. He told people, don't go back down into Egypt for horses. Egypt, throughout your scripture, is a type of the world. And so the scripture goes down into Egypt, and it begins to be corrupted, and it ends up being corrupted on what we call vellum scrolls. So these are animal skins, right? So this corrupt, the, the manuscripts corrupted by Clement and Origen, they get, they get written on these animal skins that we know as Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and there's another one, Alexandrius. And these, these are on vellum scrolls, and this happens around 331 AD. So vellum scrolls don't wear out like paper, right? So these vellum scrolls, they hang around for a long time, and they're old, but they're an old record of a corrupted manuscript. Amen? All right. So that's when we get down to here, around 382, a guy named Jerome comes in and, and he makes a, a, a Latin Bible, which ends up being translated into the Reims Douay, which is the English version of this right here. And that is your, and that is your Reims Douay. And that is your Catholic Bible, your Reims Douay, your Roman Catholic Bible with, with, with of course, the uh, Apocrypha as part of the Old Testament. All right. And so from there, Greek texts are are, are, are are fabricated here, uh, and a bunch of them, a, a bunch of a bunch of guys on this line, based on these two old manuscripts, they make Greek texts. All right, uh, translations of the New Testament Greek, and that's Griesbach and Lachman and Tregelis and Tischendorf and Alford, and the, finally the, the 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 pinnacle of it comes is. Two guys that were on the revised version uh, committee of 1881, Westcott and Hort, and they come out with a Greek text based 100% on this corrupted Vaticanus and Sidianicus from here, because what did they say? This is older. This is closer to the source, so it has to be more accurate. That was their philosophy of textual criticism, right? So they say just because because these corrupted texts were written on these animal skins in this year, that this is more reliable than this true text, which was kept by the church into the, the Syrian Peshitta Bible, the old Latin Bible, the Papri manuscripts, the Unical manuscripts. And then we get to about 522 AD and a guy named Erasmus, he comes out with a good Greek text, which is based on what we call the majority text. Remember, there's like 5,000 manuscripts for this. And they're just, they're just a couple hundred over here, just a couple hundred. And they basically only pay attention really to this one and this one. See, so this is your corrupted line, and this is your true line. And Erasmus, he makes his Greek text around 1522 A.D. And then something wonderful happens, because this Roman Catholic Church, under this uh, Jerome Bible, and the Reims Douay Bible, under the Latin Bible, and this English Bible, the, the Roman Catholic Church has had a death lock on Christianity. For well over a thousand years, the people were not allowed to have a Bible. If you had a Bible, you'd be burned at the stake. Bibles were burned. They were not allowed to know the Word of God. But what happens? The Protestant Reformation. And we all know that starts with a guy named Martin Luther in Germany. And he, he was a, a, a Roman Catholic bishop. He comes out of the Roman Catholic Church. He was one of the men that start this great reformation of people coming out of the church because they got a hold of the Bible. They got a hold of the scripture. Luther translates the Bible 
into the language of the German people, uh, 1534 A.D., and boy, it takes off after that. Then a couple more guys come in right here, and they they, they do some more good work uh, on this true line of manuscripts. And that'll be, that'll be Stephen's Greek from 1550, and Basil's Greek from 1598, and that we get down to. So what we're going to end up with here is what we call the Texas Receptus, the majority text, the received text. It is the preserved line. See, now the, the stuff it's written on isn't as old as the animal skins these are written on, but these were believers who copied it, respected, believed every single word copied it, respected it, believed every single word. This was faithfully, faithfully, faithfully. And there's thousands more evidence. And, and this, is, this is what the early, early Bibles read. The early, early Bibles read like your King James Bible. They don't read like this junk over here, right? So your, the quotes of all your early church fathers, when they quote scripture, their quotes sound like this stuff. They don't sound like this stuff over here. See, so your, your, your early church fathers are also another evidence that this line of scripture out of Antioch from the apostles is the true line. So German's Luther Bible com comes out and the, the, the Protestant Reformation blows up and now we get, now we get to the English Bible. Amen. Now we get to the English Bible and we have Good Greek text. We have the Texas Receptus. We have the majority text. And we pull in here, and a guy named Tyndale, he jumps in in 1522. We get Tyndale's Bible. Then we get a guy named Coverdale, 1535. We get the Coverdale Bible. Then in 1537, we get the Matthews Bible. Then in 1539, we get the Great Bible. And then in... Uh, uh, in 1560, we get the Geneva Bible. And in 1568, we get the Bishop's Bible. And then we get the King James Bible of 1611. Let me show you something neat right here. Psalms 12, 6 and 7 says this. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. What's seven? God's number of perfection and completion. It says, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them. What? The words of the Lord. Thou shalt keep them. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God said he would preserve each and every single word perfectly from this generation forever. And he said, Purified seven times. Watch this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hallelujah. Seven. The King James Bible, 1611. King James Bible. God's perfect word preserved through his line. In what? In the universal language of the end time. He gave it in Greek. Why? At first, because... Alexander the Great conquered the known world and imposed the Greek language on the known world. So when it was first given, it was given in the universal language of the day. What do we have now? Well, we have a printing press. We have everybody can read and everything. God gives us one perfect Bible in the universal language of the end times. That is your standard where everything else is judged by, preserved without error by divine providence. You could have the Word of God in your hand. Now, listen what the King James translators said in their dedicatory to the king. They said, <laughs> Amen, Amen. He said, uh, For when your highness had, one out, had, had once out of deep J judgment apprehended how convenient it was that out of the original sacred tongues, yeah, Hebrew and Greek, together with comparing of the labors, both in our own and other foreign language, of many worthy men who went before us, right? Right? Amen. <laughs> there should be one more. One more. Exact, 
Exact. What's exact? That's exactly right. That's exactly perfect. That's on the money. That's on the head. That's perfect. One more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. That's what they told the king when they handed him. And they those guys didn't even realize the full, the full majesty of what God had used them to create. They didn't even realize how pure and perfect what came from their labors was. But that's it. That's the book. What about over here? Huh? So you get City Atticus and Vaticanus, and they and Jerome's Latin comes out, and that's what's used for that abomination that's called the Roman Catholic Church that, that spread its influence through political power and bloody murder and inquisition and slaughter and, and politi political machinations. Uh, I mean, the, the, <laughs> what? it's worse than the mafia, brother. Study on it. Amen? And finally, it gets down, and these guys, these guys start making some Greek texts. And you'll find those by Griesenbach and Lachman and Tregellis and Tichendorf and Alford. All right. Those, those, those are other, other Greek texts. What? Based on, based on these two old, old corrupted manuscripts out of this pagan school. All right. And, uh, but then you get down here in 1881 and you got these guys, Westcott and Hort. Boy, study what those guys believed. Those guys were not even Christians. They were rank, absolute heretics. And they go in and they say, we're going to base everything on this, on these two corrupt manuscripts. And Westcott's Hort's Greek text comes out. And that's where you get your first bad English Bible from the corrupted line, the revised version of 1881. Your revised, your revised version. All right. Now, remember what I said at the onset. There's only two Bibles. There's this Bible that came from this line. And you go to any other Bible, any other Bible in the English language. And it's this Bible. It is based on these manuscripts, not on these manuscripts. And it's as simple as that. And there's, there's a couple hundred of them. Even your new King James, what a lie that is. They go into the King James and change words back to this stuff. King James, King James, new King James is not a King James. That's a lie from the pit of hell. They go back and change it to read like this mess over here. So, hey, that's where your Bible came from. If you have a King James Bible, every word, pure and perfect, <laughs> these guys... These guys, they don't even believe their Bible. They think, well, it's as close and best as we can get from what we, you know. And here's what happens. What's your final authority? What's your final authority in all matters of faith and practice? Mine is this book right here in my hand. I have God's word. See, I don't need to add anything to it. I don't need to take anything away from it. I have absolute 100% confidence and trust that every word in this book is straight from God and I need no man to explain it to me. I need no man to retranslate it for me. I, I, need, I need no one. It's, the, it's not the Bible and this, the Bible and that. It's not Jesus plus this, Jesus plus that because that, that's where you go wrong. Think about it. You add any, something to Jesus, right? You add something to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross and what do you add? Well, it's over here. Well, we got Jesus and our guru. What? Jesus and Joseph Smith. Jesus and uh, uh, Charles Taze Russell. Jesus and Ellen G. White. Jesus and Prophet Muhammad. Jesus and look, no, you can add, don't add nothing to Jesus. Listen, don't add nothing to this book either. Not this book and what this Greek scholar says. Not this book. And what, what this guy said it should have meant back in the day. Not this book and, and, and. No, it's just this book. It's just this book. And that's the difference between a King James Bible believer and anybody else reading any of those 200 right here. Because they don't even think they have a, a perfect Bible. They think they, it's close. And anytime they don't understand something, they just go into into Greek, in one of these Greeks right here, and just make it say what they want to say. So who becomes your final authority? What, what these Greek teachers say. What the Greek, that's your final authority. 
no longer the book. We have one final authority, and that's this King James Bible. And you know what? By divine providence, God preserved his word without error so that we could have an every word perfect Bible to hold in our hand in these end times to stand on and believe in and put our faith and trust. My, I have bet my eternal soul on the words of this book. Amen. And guess what? <laughs> if they were right and I'm wrong <laughs> and I'm not <laughs> and they are wrong, but if, if that was the case and we got to the judgment seat of Christ, amen, you know what? I'll just say, I'm sorry, Lord. I just believed every word. I think that's the safe position. What are these guys going to say? We thought we were smarter than you and thought we just put in there whatever we wanted to put in there, figure it out for ourselves. No, that's the devil's Bible. And that's God's Bible. Huh. And that's a promise from a God who cannot lie that you could take to the bank, Jack. For real, for real. I love you. We'll see you next time.